Wyoming PBS producer Jeffrey O'Gara is creating a documentary about the life and career of former Vice President Dick Cheney, who grew up in Casper, Wyoming. As part of the process, Mr. O'Gara sat down with the former Vice President for a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews, as well as with former colleagues and journalists who covered Mr. Cheney's career. And that essentially is what got you guys to Casper. Right. We were living in Lincoln. Uh... Eisenhower got elected, Orville Freeman became Secretary of Agriculture, reorganized the Agriculture Department, and the Soil Conservation Service was affected, and uh, Dad had a choice. He could go to Great Falls, Montana, or Casper, Wyoming, and he opted for Casper, fortunately. I used to tell the story uh, that uh, if that hadn't happened, I'd never met Lynn, and she would have had to marry somebody else. And uh, her response was yes, and then he would have been Vice President of the United States. So. He's got a dry, a very dry sense of humor, and I think you hear this from people who were his compatriots and colleagues over the years, from everybody really, that this guy who seems somewhat humorless when on camera and in interviews, in fact, is, uh, he's got a good wit to him, and he says kind of funny, aphoristic things, but he generally won't do that on camera, won't do that in interviews. You just see that he's got this um, private side uh, that has made him a lot of very loyal friends, particularly here in Wyoming, but I think elsewhere as well. It's easy to slip into a, a sort of cliched description of small town life in rural America when you talk about Casper, as it was during uh, Cheney's years from 13 on when he lived there, went to high school, uh, met his future wife, Lynn Cheney, who was a, a cheerleader and baton twirler of some renown in Casper, played football. Uh, athletics, like in almost any small town, were very important in Casper. Uh, he may not have been the best football player on the team. He certainly wasn't, actually, but he was a really determined player and, uh, and did just fine. He wasn't really political at the time, but that wasn't really what you did in Casper, Wyoming as a teenager. So I think uh, a lot of people were surprised when I decided to run to be president of the class. Um, but it wasn't a tough campaign, as I remember. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, so I can't say I was politically motivated. I enjoyed it. Uh, I uh, had a good time in high school. Um, a lot of great friends, and, and uh, we played football and baseball and, and uh, fished and, and uh, enjoyed growing up. And uh, We didn't think of it as a small town. As most places in the country, you'd look at Casper, Wyoming in the 50s, that was a small town. We always thought of ourselves as the first or second largest city in Wyoming, so we didn't have a, quite the, the small town attitude, but it had all of the, the benefits of growing up in the 50s in America. Few of the people who knew Dick Cheney in those days would say, I, you know, I see a future vice president or national figure here. Um, most of them, though, were aware of his very determined nature, his loyalty, uh, something that has mattered to him all his life, uh, any number of sort of personality traits that I think you see later. Th this quality of holding back in a group, not being the guy who talks all the time and tries to dominate, uh, something that characterized really his entire career in, in politics and in government, uh, was true then. There was an, an oil man in, in Wyoming who was really from back east and moved out named Tom Strook, and Strook would, had gone to Yale and had connections there, and in those days, that's what you needed to get into Yale, was somebody who was well-connected. He would pick one or two top students uh, from Casper and encourage them and then kind of facilitate them applying to and going to Yale. And Dick Cheney was one of them. Y Yale was kind of a disaster. Um, he didn't do well at Yale. So if he'd been a good student at Casper, he was not a good student at Yale. Um, he was popular, he had good friends there, but he was warned repeatedly that he was on the edge of being uh, kicked out just for poor grades and things. And eventually he, um, he left at one point with the encouragement of the administration at Yale. They said, come back when you're a little more ready. He tried coming back, didn't work again. So he went back and actually worked as a lineman uh, for power companies in Wyoming. And uh, that's a rough life uh, with rough people. And he lived that way, uh, spent some time in bars, got in a little bit of trouble, including uh, DUIs, and eventually actually found himself in a jail cell in Rock Springs. 
This is a big element in Dick Cheney's life and, and the things that shaped him because, you know, at that point you could say this is a guy with a pretty limited future. Um, but he came back to Casper uh, with the encouragement of Lynn, his future spouse, changed his ways, went back to school, started at uh, Casper College, ended out at the University of Wyoming, and uh, pulled himself together. Um, he and Lynn, who were now married, uh, went to the University of Wisconsin for graduate work, in his case political science, and he uh, got an, essentially an internship with a Wisconsin congressman that took him to Washington, D.C. While he was in D.C., more opportunities of that kind presented themselves, one of which was a chance to work for Donald Rumsfeld, who was a kind of a young, up-and-coming Illinois congressman who had been pulled into the Nixon administration at the time. That's where Dick Cheney first began working at the White House, was for Donald Rumsfeld. Of course, they would later be tied together in many different ways at the Department of Defense and in subsequent uh, administrations. He held a number of jobs in the Nixon administration, generally working with Donald Rumsfeld as a kind of an assistant to him or a second to him. And then when Rumsfeld went off to become an ambassador, uh, he left the White House probably just at the right time, considering what ultimately happened to the Nixon administration. When Gerald Ford took over as president, uh, he brought Donald Rumsfeld back in to be chief of staff, and Rumsfeld brought Dick Cheney in to be his assistant chief of staff. And sure enough, when Rumsfeld then moved to the Department of Defense, Dick Cheney became the youngest uh, chief of staff at the White House in history. Dick Cheney was a, a bright light, uh, a young man, very young man for that job, uh, who was getting a lot of notice and already had this quality for working with people in which he could sit quietly at a meeting, kind of assess the room, and then make the right maneuvers for his boss, the president, in a way that didn't showboat or didn't take the spotlight or anything like that, but effectively got things done. When the Ford administration left the White House, Dick Cheney kind of went on a, uh, a road trip. He left Washington, D.C., and drove back to Wyoming and thought very seriously about uh, getting into a position where he was the guy getting elected, not working for people. He'd been through a tough campaign with Ford trying to win the White House. Um, they'd lost. Uh, so he came uh, back to Wyoming as something of a fair-haired boy. I mean, he was a young man in his 30s, um, well-known nationally now. But he knew, interestingly, he knew coming back to Wyoming that the last thing he should do is walk in as a politician and sort of declare himself this great success from Washington, D.C., coming back to work for Wyoming. And, and so he did what, what politicians in Wyoming do, which is you go door to door. This is a state where you can meet almost everybody who's going to vote in an election. It's still true. And it was certainly true um, when Cheney first campaigned uh, to go to Congress that you could get in that car and start driving to communities and knock on almost every door. He was working very hard. Now, in the middle of the campaign, he had his first heart attack. He was 37 years old, and he had a heart attack. And there certainly was a moment there where one might have considered, and he did, should I drop out? Is this the end of it? Uh, he didn't. Uh, he was very forthright about it, as he would be throughout his, his career. I've had this problem. I've had this heart attack. Uh, I'm still going to run. I have to rest for a period of time, then I'll be back on the campaign trail. Uh, that uh, maybe made him even more human to the, to the voters. And uh, in fact, he, he did just fine in that race. I think he got over 60% of the vote. I think the piece of legislation that Dick Cheney would be most remembered for when he was in the House of Representatives and would rather surprise some people is the Wyoming Wilderness Bill. Um, it was a big accomplishment. Now, this is a period when a lot of uh, states around the country are trying to set aside wilderness areas, and it's generally popular, controversial, depending on which side of that you're on. Uh, Wyoming is not a state that particularly favors putting aside public land and disallowing oil and gas exploration and things like that. But that's what the Wyoming Wilderness Bill did, segregated big acreages for protection from development. And it really was one of the big accomplishments of Dick Cheney's career in Congress was getting that bill passed. After a very short time in Congress, Dick Cheney was clearly destined for a, a top leadership position. He became minority whip. 
He was right behind Bob Michael, who was the minority leader and would be the Speaker of the House if the Republicans ever got the majority. When I ran, uh, of course, I ran in part on the basis that I'd been here uh, during the Nixon and Ford administration. I had a knowledge and, and a relationship with a lot of members anyway, based on that, even though I was rel relatively junior in the House, I had been uh, in, in Washington for some time. And secondly, it was a time when uh, we changed a lot of positions on the Republican side. Uh, John Rhodes retired as leader that year, so there was a contest for minority leader, a contest for whip, a contest for policy chairman, a contest for chairman of the conference. It opened up all of those options, then uh, the opportunity existed for someone like myself to, to sneak in and, and in effect uh, become a candidate. So he was seen as uh, obviously uh, a man who would be leading his party in Congress if he chose to stay there. Interestingly, though, the area that one doesn't know much about, because it is generally kept rather secret, is his activity on the House Intelligence Committee. I, I would uh, argue uh, that uh, there is a general understanding uh, by the party, by the Republicans, on the importance of uh, adequate military capability, that, that that's the cornerstone of our security, that uh, it ought to be used, that force, that capability, our purpose, if you will, in international affairs is to promote those values we believe in, democracy, freedom, human rights. That uh, that does mean a major commitment, a steady commitment, if you will, in terms of uh, the portion of our national resources that we devote to defense capabilities. If you remember the uh, Iran-Contra controversy during the Reagan administration, this was during a period when Dick Cheney was in Congress. And he ended up writing a minority report when they did an investigation of the Iran-Contra affair uh, that really defended the practices of the White House, the Reagan White House, uh, during that matter, which involved funneling money to the Contra rebels in Nicaragua uh, in a way that um, some felt was inappropriate uh, through sales to Iran, arms sales to Iran. And in some ways, one could say that in his congressional career, this was one of the great shaping uh, roles that he played in Congress was serving on the House Intelligence Committee and it probably informed a lot of what he would later bring to bear as Secretary of Defense and as Vice President with a very big role in foreign affairs. Dick Cheney considered a run for the presidency after he had served in the George H.W. Bush administration, the 41st President of the United States, uh, as Secretary of Defense and had very successfully um, led the effort in Desert Storm as Secretary of Defense. The public generally looked very favorably on what had happened and looked very favorably on him, as well as, as Colin Powell, uh, who had worked with him uh, in Desert Storm. So he, he looked at running for president and then decided for a couple of reasons it just wasn't going to happen. Um, one was he just didn't relish the fundraising that he knew he would have to do. He did a kind of a, a road trip going around speaking for Republican candidates for Congress and, and office generally. And it was kind of his way of taking the temperature of the country and finding out what kind of response he got. Uh, there are some who would say that the polls didn't show that he got that great a response on a personal level, but his reasoning was he didn't want to raise money. He was a little concerned that his health issues, because he'd had some heart attacks, might come to bear in the public's mind and, and make it difficult for him to run. He would say, Dick Cheney would say, that at that point, in the early 1990s, he had decided not to run for national office again. He had decided it was time to try something completely new, and what that was going to be was a career in the private sector. So he went to work in Texas for the Halliburton Corporation, and he was out of politics. You know, talking to Dick Cheney, he doesn't, he doesn't emphasize the Halliburton years as um, pivotal or key or in some way informing the kind of vice president that he became. What it did do was put him in Texas, and being in Texas, George W. Bush, who was governor at the time, uh, quite naturally came to him for some help in finding somebody to be vice president on his ticket when he ran for president. Both of them will say, both President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney, that almost from the beginning, George W. Bush was looking at him as a potential vice presidential candidate, and he was saying, no, I'm not interested. Eventually, uh, they went through this process. They looked at any number of potential vice presidential candidates, and it came back to one of these meetings where uh, President Bush looks at him and says, it really ought to be you.
And at some point, after talking to his family, he said, okay. Governor Bush and Laura, thank you so much for asking us to join you in this effort. And thank you for giving me the chance to introduce my husband, Wyoming's own Dick Cheney, as the next Vice President of the United States. One of the reasons this campaign is so important, and one of the reasons I was willing to give up uh, private life and to sign on with Governor Bush and his campaign for the presidency was because of what I've seen him accomplish in Texas. At the beginning of the, of the George W. Bush, Dick Cheney administration in the first term, the vice president had unprecedented access to the president. They had regular meetings, weekly meetings, um, daily conversations. Uh, they were in touch all the time. A and Dick Cheney operated very much the way he had all through his career in politics, which is he would be at a meeting. He was a presence. You could always sense he was there. When he said something, it was pretty important, but he didn't say a lot. Uh, what he was able to do, though, was talk to the president privately in a way that vice presidents historically rarely do. So he, th they had a very, uh, I'd call it a very, a very intimate administrative relationship. They were not friends in the sense of vacationing together, hunting together, doing things like that that Dick Cheney did with some long, lifelong close friends, including politicians, not, not him and, and George W. Bush. And later, particularly in the second term, of the Bush-Cheney administration. Other advisors like Condoleezza Rice began playing a more important role and that kind of ready access that Dick Cheney had enjoyed for so long uh, seemed to be reduced considerably in the second term. There are a number of people who worked closely with Dick Cheney in Congress, in the first Bush administration, George H.W. Bush's administration, uh, and later even in George W. Bush's administration who feel this, that he became something of a different person, that he was not the same person in this later incarnation as vice president. Dick Cheney uh, would argue with him and, and does in our interviews that, uh, no, he, he didn't change, the world changed. And the, you know, the change that matters tremendously was what happened on 9-11. But he would say that that goes back to his days on the Intelligence Committee in the House when he first saw sort of the underside of the world and what's really going on out there. And uh, that the world as it is uh, requires the kind of response he feels that um, the Bush-Cheney administration made. Dick Cheney thinks it's important well, think, uh, to speak out and speak the truth. You know, there have been any number of times in his career when he's decided, I'm not running uh, for any higher office. This is... I'm going to be vice president, but I'm not going to run for president. Therefore, I don't have to be calculating in a political sense. I can speak the truth. And I, I think he sees himself as a very frank, uh, straightforward, straight shooter. And really, for much of his career, people have seen him that way. Uh, I think in the public eye, he's got a kind of a darker cast now. Um, but I think in his own mind, he still sees himself as being essentially a truth teller, somebody who'll say the things that other people find too uncomfortable to say or are afraid to say for political reasons or whatever. Uh, I know right now he feels it's important to speak out about Iraq. And of course, he's been talking about the Obama administration where his president, George W. Bush, remains relatively silent about all these things. He thinks it's important for him to continue to speak what he sees as the truth, even when it's an uncomfortable truth. I mean, I want, and I assume viewers want, a deeper understanding of who Dick Cheney is. He's played an enormous role in not just American history, but world history now. And we need to understand, you know, what, what's, what are the thought processes? What is the personality? Um, what were the motivations? Uh, what's his judgment? about where he took the country and the role he played. Uh, those are all things of interest. Um, and we'll look at that from his viewpoint and from the viewpoint of people both pro and con in his camp and out of his camp.